Marianne has been integral to the entire process from beginning to end, including taking pictures and video and being um, uh, such a good person with getting to know other folks and know how to talk to anybody that she's been the entree to so many things that we've done. Um, and getting to know Unchen and Tressa, those are Irish names of people who live out in Eris, the same area that we talked about last week where the Shell um, had that uh, gas development project. And these people are keepers of knowledge of, of history and of the people and the place out in Eris. Part of that is the Irish language. Um, although 35%, 30% uh, of, the, of the people in the Republic speak Irish, 5% of you use it regularly, and it is the official language of Ireland. If you are running for the parliament, you better be able to speak Irish because some of the session formalities and things are done in Irish. So that means that you have to be able to speak it. But in many areas in the West, um, whether it is down in Kerry along the Barra Peninsula or up a little ways in Kerry onto the Dingle, at the tip of Clare and all along Galway's coast and up in Mayo and the area of Pulatamas where these folks are from actually Karateeg uh, across the bay um, are Irish language speakers and all the schools K through 13 in the area are English is the second language. Unchin and Tressa are very, very special people. This is spectacular. Yeah. That is the difference. And you're talking about 200 feet higher. Yes. Yeah. This is amazing. 600 million years here at Cage of Fields, you have 400 million years. These are the Dalradian quartzites. At Cage of Fields, you have Caverniferous sandstone. And even at Run Row, and I'll just, we'll just drive to there later on just for, for a few minutes, where the actual sandstone. Uh, during the Caledonian mountain building phase uh, between the two oceans, between the Lapidus and the Atlantic Ocean, there was the mountain building phase down where the actual sandstone is sticking right up into the air. Uh, it's vertical. They are vertical yeah. And they are one billion years old. Does that rock out there have a name? It's a rated edge on it. Okay. It's very straight. Yeah. If you look at it from the other side, they call it Kalimishkina, the knife rock. It's the only place in this country that it leeches Petra. Oh, wow. Petra. Wow. What kind of a bird is that? It's, it's a very small bird. It's, uh, uh, the star Petra is something, it's like, it's like a swallow. It's like a swallow, a little tail, and it, 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 it lives it most of its time at sea. It doesn't come on shore except to breed. Oh. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the Stags of Broadhaven are 1.6 billion years old and are part of the North American coastline left behind when the two continents broke up 60 million years ago. You will find the same rock in Nova Scotia and on the North American coastline. The rock on the left is known as Anthion or the oven. The smaller rock is known as Karaknefuilhoge or the seagull's rock. Then you have Chahona Likleji, named after a man who went out to do a bird count one time and got up marooned there overnight, and the rock got named in his honour. Then you have the Chahbag, the small house, and Chahmoor, the big house, and at the back a rock called the Bard Brjega, or the false boat. And at night time, if you're on the far side of the stags and the moon is shining down, you look at it's clear there's a, a boat coming towards you, and it's just a rock in the moon. In the, in, in the wow. Have you seen that tail? Oh, yeah. We fish this coastline from Eris Head in the west to Down Patrick Head in the east. We fished for mackerel, herring, salmon, lobster, and crab. My father's Corrach was the last Corrach to fish for salmon out of Porto Cloy in the 1960s. One night they caught 154 salmon. There was five men and five nets in the boat and when they reached the shore there were only six inches to spare between the gunnel and the water.
This is the bog that is harvested for heating very, very dirty fuel. At about a millimeter a year. And the man says, a millimeter a year? That much? Yeah. <laughs> that little rather. And Seamus says, no, he says, that much? <laughs> because on a slope, he says, it doesn't even grow a millimeter a year. It grows about a millimeter every three years. And he said, but sure, that's... You know, that millimeter is on. But he says in a thousand years, it's a meter. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. You're talking about, you, you, you know, you're cutting five meters back, you know. You know and we'd say, you cut the first three a, a meter, and you're, 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 you have the first two meters, you're back, you're back at the time of Christ. Like, right. <laughs> yeah. You cut yeah. the back there. And you're now, these have been cut along the edge here, right? Yeah. Yes, they have, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, you know people. Could so that's back about a you know, um, one millennium. Yeah, one millennium, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what we, that's what we say about us, like yes, when you're talking right. about the and how much it grows. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Our hundred years, right? <laughs> 100 millimeters, 4 inches. <laughs> if, we got, if we're lucky, we get the 4 inches before we get the 6 feet under. This is Andona, an Iron Age promontory fort, occupied between 500 BC and 500 AD. A promontory fort is surrounded by water on three sides, leaving the landward end with defence walls and the remnants of the defence walls can still be seen here today, even though they were a lot higher then. It consisted of about six acres at the time and had its own spring well. Well, you know, it, it doesn't look like the waves are much there till a boat comes in there. They say it goes back to 600 AD. Yeah. So they, they, that graveyard has a great history, really, a, a very and a poignant history as well. That kind of tells the story of the many peoples who've lived out here. You have, yeah, as we were saying, it, it, you know, it, it, it is. Um, you have like, the Catholics are in it, the Protestants are in it, mm -hmm. the unbaptized children, the sailors that came ashore from both world wars. Both World Wars and yeah. the people that were lured ashore and killed, they're buried there. Mm -hmm. Everybody mm -hmm. at the end. So that's Unshin taking us on, on tour many times. He's taken us out. And uh, um, his, his wife, uh, Tressa, is also very much involved. And she has done all of the dating and understanding of who is buried in this extended cemetery. Um, that that we're told by Unchin, it actually goes back to almost pre-Christian times to like three or four hundred A.D. Um, Teresa is uh, um, also the development manager of their of their organization, which is called Dun Komar Dun Kohain Teo, which is a community center. Um, and this is a map that Unchin has made of all of the local places names, the names in Irish, um, and also a guide that um, tells you the translation between Irish and English. And uh, most of the names have, have functional things to understand history of, of local people or of what was done at that area. Now, this is their community center that they run. They, by the way, these were early members of Shell to Sea and the uh, attempts to keep Shell out, um, their involvement did cause some issues for them because they they um, um, lost out on some government grants early on because of that association. Then after that, they had to fight off Shell, who kept wanting to give them money, and they didn't want to be beholden to Shell in any way. Um, they uh, set up a different organization 
um, other than Shell to see because they had some ideas about where maybe the the path should be taken, but it was never taken up. And they are are folks that have been able to maintain friendships with everyone in in the area, whether they were for Shell or anti Shell. Um, the pictures across the bottom is Tressa, Tressa uh, in a publicity still for a a. Uh, um, a BBC television show that was a, called Lesser Known Places, and they came out to talk to Unchen and Tressa. The next picture over is the kids from the local school, um, middle school, um, whose uh, the principal of the school now is the daughter of, of one of the original Shell to See people that we knew, uh, Michal, Michal O'Shine. Um, it's also, you'll see the next to the right is a daycare center that operates out of this building and all kinds of, of Irish language services get done here. And finally, to the right, uh, a lot of work that they do in archaeology on um, stone circles and whatnot. And then this circle is Tressa on the left, then a, the man who found Cajia Fields, a very famous um, archaeological site about 20 miles away. Um, our good friend, Niall King, next to it, who was involved in the next project that they became involved with. And uh, um, Terrence Conway, the cameraman, um, uh, to the very far right. This is their, their quarterly newsletter, which is given in both Irish and in English. And the uh, picture on the left shows a, uh, a place where many of the people who worked on the current project that they're doing, which is a, a project that takes a, a book that was from the sixth century in Scottish Gaelic about the area where, where um, they live. Um, and one of the um, mythological cycle tales um, which they in turn have, you can see on the right, is the book cover um, of the translation that they did into modern Irish and English. And uh, part of the team were many of the folks from, uh, from Shell to Sea, uh, like Mihol and, and, and Niall, um, all former uh, retired educators. Um, that's a, a really wonderful place that teaches Irish to anyone. Okay, this is a, a chapter about Terence Conway, the cameraman, and it's a follow-up on um, what happened after the gas plant opened. Um, everybody knows him. We met people all over Ireland and in, in the north um, of, of progressive causes that, that know Terence Conway. Um, and by February of, of 2013, even though the plant wasn't open yet, they were back to just the most um, dedicated members of Shell to Sea who carried on, and, and Terence and Mora were among them. And uh, they even, you know, made regular uh, uh, presentations and press releases to try and keep things going for Shell to Sea, um, but not really successfully because the government had moved on and folks were sure that they needed the gas, but Terence didn't give up. And now here is the, a, a place that is just looking over the bay where the gas comes in um, and taken when we were there. And it tells the story now of a year later, a year after the gas is started. This is Terrence Conway reporting uh, live from outside Balnaboy Refinery, uh, reporting from Shell Statoil's refinery at Balnaboy, County Mayo in Ireland. Uh, the flaring we see going on in the background is emergency flaring as a result of Shell and Statoil putting uh, gas into the national grid that wasn't treated with an odour. As a result, there's a, a serious danger to people in towns all over Mayo, Galway, uh, possibly further afield. 
uh, and I noticed today on the journal.ie that Michael Ring, a local TD, is certainly concerned about what's going on. The strange thing is, uh, when the Rossford Five were in jail, Michael Ring at a rally in Castle Bar stated that if necessary, he would go to jail to stop what Shell were doing here because of the danger to the community. Suddenly he went silent. It appears to me that the big boys and girls in Fine Gael called him aside and told him to shut his mouth because there hasn't been a word from him since. He abandoned the community when Shell and Statoil polluted the local drinking water supply with aluminium for an extended period of time. He abandoned the community when the Gordy kicked and battered men, women and children. Uh, this is further proof, what's going on here is further proof why a refinery should not be allowed within the middle of a community. The regulatory authorities here in Ireland are as much to blame than as Shell and Statoil. Yeah, there's security in their huts here, just inside the gate here. Uh, Ring now. There is a prepared. Ring now. Just in about 49 this morning. The flaring kept up for 24 hours. The people of Eris paid the toll. From the place that we stayed at, in the stone circle, and gives you a flavor of, of Nile and Terrence showing us around the place, looking back at the bay where the pipeline comes in at, at hundreds of pounds per square inch. The bay is always roiling because there's a river that comes out and the tide comes in and the water is always in turmoil. We'll see a little bit later more detail about this, but even up into 2016, 2017, they came to Dublin to protest and had help from many kinds of people. The reason why is because people love this area and they had begun to heal even though they were worried here's where the landfall gas comes in nile irish speaker brought us around just to show you about 2017 how things have changed but not changed the picture on the left the gentleman who or gentleman who has his arm around the other guy wrote this his name is brian brian leeson and he is um reminding people in 2017 about how cruel and bitter the government was and how they did not care about what, what, what the environment was or what people had to say or the lives of the people. Um, but it became a bellwether. And now the top fight in that was over the privatization of water. They didn't get away with it because people from all over came together and among them were the people from Shell to Sea who came to remind them that the, the government could not be, be um, trusted. You'll remember from last class, uh, we celebrated, we were at a, at a ceremony for the celebration of the uh, equinox. And uh, after that, we had breakfast in a little cafe at Lo Crew, Nellie's Kitchen, and met a young woman there uh, named Una. 
And she joined us at our table and we told her about our trip. And she asked us, where are you going next? And we told her we were headed for Belfast for a few days and then on to a town called Valley Castle to volunteer for three weeks at Cori Mila. And uh, she said, her face just brightened up. She said, I'm from Valley Castle. You've got to come and visit me when, uh, when you get there. So we told her we would. And we saw her several times. The first time we visited her at her family's uh, bakery and cafe right in the center of Valley Castle and had a lovely breakfast there. And another time uh, we saw her, uh, she came to visit us and wanted to show us the new hotel in her town, which was uh, had gorgeous views of the sea and also back to Valley, Valley uh, back to Corimila which is beyond that windmill there, covered by all the trees. It's a very private, beautiful place. We also went to this town called Ballantoy. And in the um, Game of Thrones, this is the scene of the Iron Island or Theon Greyjoy's home. Uh, this is one of her favorite places growing up as a kid in the area. It's the ruins of an old castle called Kinbane Castle. It was built in 1547 by the Donald O'Donnell family, I think it was. And uh, from that and ridge. From that ridge. We're climbing back up. It was about a million stairs down to the sea to that castle. Now I'm pulling myself up there. We could also see from that area a place called Carica Reed. And we'd been there before. We had been there before. This is the rope bridge from the mainland out to an island. And this place was fished by the local fishermen for years. And over a period of 300 years, there were many bridges, rope bridges that were made. And they were fishing for salmon back then. And this bridge was finally built, I think, in the year 2000. Folks figured that was safer than some of the boating around the outside to be on the, uh, the, the ocean side of, of that island, and that it was safer for the salmon fishermen to do it this way. And, and now it's become a, a great tourist attraction. And a chapter on the Troubles. I'm sure most of you have heard of the Troubles, but... Um, as my friend John Barry says, the people of Northern Ireland are marching into the future, tripping over and looking at the past, the long past, the recent past, and now, and the hopes for a shared future. Those tourist places that we went to see have only been open in the last 10 or 15 years as the Game of Thrones production all because the Troubles had ended. But the Troubles go all the way back to King Billy and the Protestant ascendancy after 1690. Two kings of England fought it out on Irish soil in the Boyne Valley in 1690, a Catholic named James and a Protestant named William. William won in the Battle of the Boyne, Protestant ascendancy began from there. The political, economic, and social domination of all of Ireland between the 17th century and the 20th century by a minority of landowners, Protestant clergy, uh, the landowners were mostly, were mostly Protestant, members of the profession who were Protestant, and members of the established church, the Church of Ireland or the Church of England by Anglophiles. The time was also noted by an amazing amount of penal laws. And here's just the highlights. No Catholic between 17th and 19th century. Some of these laws came in. Some of them went out at various times. No Catholic could vote or be elected. A ban imposed on Catholics from owning any buying land. Those that did own land um, could not pass it on to their children unless their children became Protestant. Um, they couldn't lease land for more than 31 years, and the value that they had to pay was worth more than most times than it was worth. And they weren't allowed to have guns. 
They weren't allowed to intermarry between Protestants and Catholics, banned from living in some towns and barred from holding mass sometimes. The clergy, Catholic clergy, had to be registered and required to take an oath of loyalty to Great Britain and not to wear their uh, uh, vestments outside of a church. But friars and monks and the hierarchy and the Jesuits were all supposed to be exiled. Catholics and dissenters were required to pay tithe to the Anglican church anyway. And then in the 1840s came the famine. See on the left is a, is a uh, classic picture of that time period of the blithe that was on the famines and the art carries over to today on the upper right and um, statues in Dublin of people leaving Ireland. More than a million and a half people left Ireland over the tw course of 20 years. And the Irish population is only back to what it was in 1849 nowadays. On the bottom left picture is a, uh, um, on the Liffey in that, that splits Dublin of a sample of what the famine ships were. Um, and by the way, the famine didn't happen. They, a lot of people call it the great hunger rather than the great famine in Ireland because there had been plenty of food that had been grown and there was plenty of cattle. Only the landowners who were Anglo-Irish um, shipped the, all of that for money back to England. So there was no food for the people. The bottom middle picture is a, um, a marker where a large number of, of Irish peasants um, who worked on a Anglo-Irish um, Englishman's land came to beg for food and were turned away. And it's in the Sheffrey Hills and it's commemorated uh, the hunger of their walk in 1849 and it also references the third world today and how people themselves are honored by humiliation of their fellow man, as Mahatma Gandhi said. What's interesting, the Cherokee natives of the United States sent aid to Ireland during the famine. Well, by the end of the 1800s, the split was pretty clear between Northern Ireland and the rest. The majority in the North did not want to be separated. Um, in the 19th century, Irish Catholics demanded some, some better rights. By the 1880, they were clamoring for home rule, but Protestants in particular, they were in the majority in the North and they wanted to be a part of Britain. And guess what? Those same issues are still occurring today. The next set of events is when the April 16th rebellion occurred, the famous Easter Rising capturing the post office, which was the main means of communications of the day, and all revolutions grab the up-to-date communications technology, whether it is a post office or now a next a, a um, radio station or controlling the internet always that that kind of thing occurs. Well, the British troops quickly crushed the uprising, but it was a turning point in Irish republicanism. And in 1922, the British allowed Ireland to become a free state, but retained the North as part of Great Britain. The North not only had a Protestant majority, but Belfast had become an industrial center for textile industry and uh, the main shipbuilding city of Ireland, of, of England now, was Belfast. The ill-fated Titanic was built here. Uh, and that shipyard is now a great modern museum. And next to it, the big film studios for Game of Thrones. But after the rising and the separation came a time of troubles in the 60s. Decades of segregationist policies created a society in Northern Ireland where Protestants and, and, and Catholics lived entirely separate lives, educated in different schools, 
different workplaces, drank in different pubs. Confrontation between Northern Ireland's Protestants and Catholics came to a head in the late 60s. Catholics initiated their own civil rights struggle modeled on the U.S.'s civil rights struggle, only it was about religion and not the color of your skin. Um, they protested against housing allocations that were unfair, employment conditions, voting restrictions for Catholics were still in place, and gerrymandering so that they never had a chance to have much of a voice in government. And over the next 30 years of sectarian violence, thousands of people died. Many failed attempts at peace, temporary ceasefires, disastrous peace talks broken off, broken promises, shattered agreements, bombings all over Ireland in the North and the South and bombings in England. In the end, it took outsiders in 1998 to come up with the Easter agreement. And that involvement only happened because of the folks on the upper right who aren't Northern Irelanders at all. James Hawhey, the man on the left of that picture on the upper right was the Taoiseach of, of the Republic of Ireland. And there's Tony Blair next to him. And there's Billy Clinton next to him. And to the right is George Mitchell, who did all of the negotiating to this peace agreement, then culminating in the 1998 agreement. But there were many compromises in the Good Friday Agreement, too many to please everybody. Even today, the situation is fraught with tension, anxiety, and violence. Now, on the lower set of pictures on here, um, um, the man gentleman on the left, is named Ian Paisley, and he is the head of, was the head of the DUP, which is the um, Loyalists organization, and also head of the UVF, the paramilitary organization that shadowed underneath with the violence for all those years. And next to him is Martin McGuinness, who was a Sinn Féin politician and also head of the IRA four times during the war, but they finally settled into peace. Um, there's a picture from about a decade later with Arlene Foster in the middle, who was then um, head of the um, coalition government along with the gentleman on the right, Jerry Adams. He is now retired and Ian Paisley is dead. Martin McGuinness has also died. The coalition government broke up with the coming of Brexit, so Northern Ireland is now run by the civil service under the auspices of Great Britain. So far, peace, though tenuous, seems to be holding. But violence is never too far away, even still, because the hard and fast um, people who were in the provisional armies are still extant there, and they have become gangs trying to keep the, their respective uh, religious people in the poorer sections into them and uh, gun running and uh, drug sales are what they do now. And uh, the most tragic recent death was of a journalist and more and more journalists are beginning to uh, uh, be targeted in Northern Ireland. And with the things going on now in, uh, Brexit, there are fears that there will be troubles again. But in the face of this is a place called Corimia, Corimila, which is a place where we will learn to give back. And it's a Corimila is a peace and reconciliation center in Northern Ireland on the uh, North Coast. Um, it is an ecumenical Christian community committed to the work of reconciliation locally and worldwide, started in 65 by a gentleman named Ray Davies. Um, it's dedicated to healing for the victims of sectarian violence during the Troubles. Um, we applied to be short-term volunteers at this place. Application process was comprehensive, long, long application. We had to have a teleconference interview, give references of people in Ireland who knew us, and a criminal background check. Um, but 
even though we mentioned to them that we weren't really, I, we weren't Catholic or Protestant, that we didn't uh, um, at this time follow a, any religion, they said that didn't matter. Uh, subsequently, we found out that there have been many that Dalai Lama spent the week in this place. Um, but here it is. Here's three places on campus. Um, on the left is a prayer that someone can say if if it's their turn to uh, um, to give thanks before a meal and they don't know what to say. But basically non-denominational. The upper picture on the right is the main building, which has the kitchen the main dining hall, um, dormitories, and meeting rooms for, uh, for events. The bottom right is what is called the Cree, the religious um, center. And Cree means heart in Irish, and it's actually a spiral around the outside into a circle in the middle. Um, Marianne and I went there often for service in the mornings but it was our kind of service. There was not any prayers said. It was more like a, a Quaker meeting because you sat there in silence, contemplating or reading if you wanted to, or reading prayers or um, just sitting there quietly. And it was a grand experience. And then there was a, 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 a non-denominational prayer afterwards. And then you went about your work for the day. And the, Key program areas of Koimila are first about that sectarianism and people being marginalized for being on one side of it or the other and living at the edge of a community and dealing with the legacies of this conflict and fourth, a public theology. Well, here's the duties that we had. Um, the hospitality is one category and that's where you welcome people as they arrive helping with a, with the a luggage, uh, assisting in center orientation with people and registration and bed plans, um, to assist in tea, making sure that there's always tea and coffee and snacks for people between um, programs, and to assist in the setup, a breakdown of group spaces and evening supper preparation, as opposed to breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Supper is an evening time where they get people together and give them hot chocolate, and toast, because at Corimila, at all of these places, there is no alcohol, part of that program. They often have people associated with programming, things like Alcoholics Anonymous have events there, and the troubles with abuse of alcohol and drugs. So they're not allowed. Then it's time for housekeeping, which where you're divided. You take certain times, you do one and the other or the other. And you had to, you know, do real cleaning, like you were the, the cleaning staff of, of watching things and wiping things down, whether it was in the bedroom or cleaning the bathrooms and the toilets, cleaning the dining areas and all public spaces and washing windows. And we took our turn at that, too. But my favorite area was the kitchen. Um, and there, yeah, mostly you did dishes and did pots and pans but you also served out food and did involve some of the preparation of, of, the, of two of the evening meals and assist in the cleaning and maintenance of that kitchen. Now the head chef, when I first came in there, William said to me, are you Catholic or Protestant? And I said, and the way he said it to me, I figured I'd give him back at his, his own edge. I said, no, um, I am an animist pagan. And he said, yes, but are you a Catholic pagan or a Protestant pagan? And then we laughed. He is a, uh, a former Catholic who fell in love with and married a Protestant and is now raising his family with Protestants. All of the staff were local people and all very, very warm and loving and open and helping to us. But we did get some chance to do some programming duties to help the program staff in facilitating events that they have there and doing some of these kinds of things like icebreakers, participating in adventure learning experiences, uh, facilitating small group discussions, arts and craft sessions, those kinds of things. 
And we got to do that for two kinds of events. Um, one was an annual meeting of the members of Cori Mila. And Cori Mila has an international membership of people who only come back once a year if they can get there. Um, whether they live in the United States, there are, there are Cori Mila associations in New York City and Boston and Chicago. Um, there are members from England. There are members from the Republic and members from Northern Ireland. <clears throat> and they have an annual meeting. And this one was about caring for creation from the perspective of climate change and how their organization should be responding to this and what the church's role is. Like, like John Barry said in the last class, um, sometimes this kind of thing occurs with folks that aren't primarily um, environmental activists, but come at it through their religious beliefs. And that's the weekend that we had there. And I got to participate in many events that weekend and did storytelling for the children on the first night. We also got to participate with um, Slemish College. And that is uh, a, a program for what would be our 13th year of high school, that bridge that in some ways, I guess it's like a, um, community yeah, like a community college. But this is a community college that has Catholics and Protestants and all of these kids, only about 15% of children in Northern Ireland are in integrated religious schools. This is the first time that these students were spending a significant amount of time with people from the other community, from the other. And uh, so we got to participate with that. That We didn't have many pictures because it is a safe area and it is a place where people don't want to be photographed. And in some instances, there are instances where it would be unsafe for them to be photographed. But this is the area of the dorm where we live with the other staff. Oh, by the way, in this area, you, the young people who work here can have alcohol when they're off, but only in the context of this facility, and they're allowed no place else on campus if they have it. Yeah, and in the background, the two older adults are Ran and Betsy. And they were, uh, she was the head of the volunteer program and her husband was uh, the manager of the workers in the volunteer program. And they were from Atlanta, Georgia. And the two girls on the left were from the US and the lady in front in the pink and red jacket, her name is Gloria and she was from Spain. So most of the people are long-term volunteers. That is, they, they spend at least one year there. And then there are middle term and short term volunteers. So the Lady Gloria and the gentleman in the back to the left of Betsy, the uh, head of the program, he was from the UK. They both were um, middle, like a three month term. And up on the upper right picture is a young lady from Indonesia. She was one of the long term volunteers. And on the lower right, on the right, is a young man from Ghana. Emmanuel and a young woman from Belfast. And so most of the volunteers are young in their 20s or early 30s. And up here on the left again is Betsy. And down below is Gloria and I kind of bonded together. And uh, on the upper right is Ellis. He was another head manager. of programming and, a, and, and an ordained, and ordained minister. Yeah. And on the far right is Domas. He was from Lithuania. And down below is the Polytunnel. They grew their own food there. Now, it is time for us to go back in time and a pilgrimage walk that we took for Halloween, the pre Christian Celtic. This is a hike. It, took, it was about a mile long. It started at the park so walking up in Athboy right away. on the Fair Green. That's in County Mead. And we were hiking up to what they call the Hill of War Ward. And the Celtic ceremony of Plata has been revived, mixing the ancient past and the 21st century with a reenactment of the Celtic celebration. 
started with this walk and um, we get to the top of the hill. So this is the end of the Celtic year and the beginning of the new year. The Celts believed that this was a time of transition when the veil between our world and the next came down and the spirits of all who had died since the last night of Samhain moved on to the next life. Led by Gemma McGowan, the uh, young woman that you met from uh, the, the walk and the, and the equinox, and um, this grew over from the last 20 years from a hundred people to thousands the last time we went there in 2019. This is the event from 2015, I think, the very first one. It was only about a thousand people here. The next, uh, the next portion will be Gemma telling the story of uh, Klachta. Um, she, in a way, is a um, progressive social activist, and you can tell when she tells the story. What we are doing here is a representation. It is an echo of what our ancestors did here. And you have all heard the call of that echo. You have all heard the call of that story. And it has brought you to this place on this night to be a part of this ceremony and this circle of people. Well, this is the ancient new year. This is the time where we descend into darkness so that the people can rest so that new life can be brought into being because all life must begin in darkness like the child in the womb like the seed beneath the earth waiting for its moment in the springtime to burst forth once more so that is why they celebrated the new year at this time it was the last harvest it literally means the end of summer when the earth gave forth her last great abundance to the people, the berries were gathered, the apples were gathered, and all those animals that could not be fed through the winter were slaughtered, and great feasts were held amongst the people. It is a celebration of the ancestors. This is the time when the veil between the worlds is at its thinnest, and the other world is so close to us, we can reach out and touch it. The most feared of all of the Druids of Ireland was the one-eyed Druid, Mog. All within the country were so terrified of him because he had an insatiable thirst for knowledge and for power. He was great and he was mighty and he was rather terrifying. And he had a fair, beautiful and wise daughter named Klakta. <laughs> Isn't she lovely? <laughs> and together they travelled all the length and breadth of their era, meeting with all of the magical peoples and learning from them. Now, in Mog Rua's case, he was also after their power, but look to herself, she was in search of wisdom and knowledge. And so great was his thirst for knowledge that Mog Rua took his daughter Klokta away to Italy to meet with a great sorcerer by the name of Simon the Magus. Ooh. And they sent her off on a great crest around the world to meet with all of the magical peoples, seeking out knowledge wherever they might find her. To the Norse lands they sent her, where she learned the art of the runes and of the deep trance work of the safe. 
To ancient Greece they sent her, where she learned the arts of mathematics and astronomy and philosophy. Back to fair era they sent her, where she learned all of the arts of the ancient megalithic mounds and all of the magic of the Celtic people. And finally, she flew back to Italy once more, and there she brought all of the knowledge, all of the wisdom, all of the magic back to Simon Magus and to her father. And when they looked upon her and they saw how full of wisdom, how full of magic, how full of knowledge they were, well, they weren't very happy at all. <laughs> She had gone out, she had experienced the mysteries. She had gone on her travels. She had truly found the magic that exists inside herself. And their jealousy and their rage knew no ends. And so it was that she was handed over to the three sons of Simon Magus and they took her and they violated her and they sent her away into exile. She made her way back, back to the land of her birth, back to Era. And she made her way to this very hill on which we all stand right now. And when she got here, she was very heavily pregnant. Pregnant with, with triplets. And on a sour night, she gave birth to them. Right here on this hill. To three sons. To Dorob. To Kuma. And to Muak. And so hard was the labor and so long was it that she was exhausted and she could do no more. She knew that her life was coming to an end. And so, with one last great bout of courage and wisdom and magic, she called aloud the names of her son to the sky. And she declared that as long as the names of those sons were remembered in this land, then no invading force could ever come here, here and steal this come island's here. sovereignty. And we did forget their names. And we stopped calling their names. And the story of Klakta and the story of this hill for so many years lay quiet, lay silent. Until 16 years ago. So we can look, we can look at this passage of time from the worship of Mother Nature and all the elemental forces to the worship of the sun in the sky to the worship of Jesus Christ himself in the New Testament. So we can see the story as a document of that time. We can see Clockbe herself and, and her story as one of oppression within a patriarchal society that wanted to take everything from her and did take everything from her. Much as the society we live in today, those in great power take what they want from those who have little to nothing. Or we can see her as the great heroine, the great heroine, the martyr who gave her life for the people of this country. Or we can simply see her as the earth itself and her sons as the last great abundance 
of the final harvest at the end of the summer, giving forth the fruits, the berries, and the animals to the people to sustain them through the winter. But however we perceive her and however we perceive her story, we call her back from the midst of time to be with us. The next chapter is about Mora, a modern day Kalia who's afraid of nothing and no one, Shell to see Ken Karawiwa and the Ogoni. Yeah, we were invited to participate in uh, with Shell to See campaigners and Afri campaigners commemor commemorating the 20th anniversary of the deaths of Ken Sarawiwa and eight other activists called, it was called the Ogoni Nine. Yeah, that was called and, a judicial murder. Right. And uh, this took place in front of the Corib House in uh, Dublin. And, at, and that was Shell's Irish headquarters. The activists carried crosses bearing the names of each of the men executed by the corrupt Nigerian government on November 10th, 1995. Mm -hmm. Yes, Tommy? Yeah, what you doing here, man? Well, now we've come to mark the 20th anniversary of the judicial hanging of Ken Sarawiwa and his fellow activists. Outside, uh, here outside Carab House, Shell headquarters in Ireland. The, uh, uh, Shell were heavily in cases like in a judicial murder or hanging. Yes. Twenty years ago. Most definitely. And, uh, but there was also a, a civil case taken against them, and there was something like fifteen million. Was it an order court settlement? There, there was, but that's the problem, Tommy. Uh, Money is always the remedy, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's factored in to everything. You will solve everything, just bulldoze two people, murder people, and then you will solve it eventually by offering a pittance to the relatives, and particularly the, the children, because they will be bullied, bullied. Can you turn that off, please? Would you mind turning that off? This is a public area, man, okay? That's you fine. have no veto power, whether I'm, I'm video I, I, or not. I, I, this not. is a public area. This poor guy is uh, an executive for a company that uh, okay. Okay. rented out so this go, space right. that used to be Shell, you Shell's around the corner. And even though it says Karib House, we're demonstrating out of this, in front of this guy's business that has nothing to do with it. And, uh, but the dueling cameras is always a part of demonstrations now in, in uh, Ireland. Um, but, so we moved around to where it was that the, new, the offices have moved to and the carrying all out. Oh, by the way, here is. Aha. Were you at the meeting, anti fracking meeting last week? I was, and I, I was speaking to the door at the time, but I sent someone to us. Okay. You know what I was surprised at? I was surprised that, that um, Eamon Ryan was down in front and was so much a part of of that oh uh, yeah so look at he's a prostitute oh. yes <laughs> yes we parked across the road oh my Hello. god how are you you brought the weather amazing that uh, in the short time that we were there that we were able to meet so many so many folks and uh, this would be like having a congressman come over and start talking to you in the united states these two politicians are no longer um uh, in the Dow as uh, parliamentarians in Irish politics, but now have been um, elected by the peers to be, uh, by the their constituents in Ireland to be in the European Parliament. And they spent the day with us and they're, they're, they're um, activists, progressive activists who are regularly meet with uh, um, American um, 
anti-war protesters. Uh, the uh, oh, here's Mora giving a a policeman hell, saying, "What authority does he have to tell us to take down our sign?" Fierce, fierce lady. I haven't heard any legal authority for it. I am being extremely reasonable now and helpful and yeah, beginning yeah, yeah. to to get it. But I don't, I'll state it on camera for the record, that B, whatever his name, number is, I've called it out to you already. Um, he told me he wanted it taken down. And that the people who own this building want it taken down. But that is not a lawful authority. That is not exercising lawful authority under which he's going to try to do me under a section eight and a section nine for um, without reasonable excuse, bloody blah. blah. Instruction, yeah. Um but he didn't quote me. Yeah. Under what legal basis? Right, like, yeah. He is asking me to remove this, other than he wants it done because Jill clicked their fingers and told him to get it done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Mora is pretty amazing. She uh, um, knows the rules and the law. She has been arrested a number of times, was on a hunger strike, was in jail and never gives up. She is now part of uh, Love, Love Leitrim of late, as well, along with, uh, with Terence. Um, so this is Mora under various guises. In the upper left, we finally see... Ken Sarawua and the Agoni people had been actively... Demonstrating to thwart um, the shell from, from developing there. Yeah, they had been peacefully uh, demonstrating in Nigeria, trying to uh, stop shell oil from coming onto their lands and again it was similar to uh ross Park because they were indigenous people who were farmers and fishermen and it was never explicitly proven that shell ordered the killing they did benefit from the outcome and later paid reparations to the families in 2009 Shell said out of court to the tune of $15.5 million to the families of the victims to avoid going to court in the USA. Here's Sister Magella McCarran, who introduced Ken Sarawiwa's daughter, and her name is New, New Sarawiwa, and who, we, who we went to see that evening, presentation about her new book. And the rest of the pictures here are of... Uh, the Kalia, who, who is Maura Harrington. This is her husband, Misha. Yes, Misha. And her at various places. Um, one of the times she was arrested was as a result of this, where she um, was obstructing a Garda and she was arrested for beating up the Garda. And this is when she was coming out of jail for that, the one on the right, and had been on a hunger strike. An amazing lady. She can make you laugh, but it seems to she talks about her. Her life seems to be like William Butler Yeats speaks of many Irish, that being Irish is has an abiding sense of tragedy, which sustains her through temporary moments of joy. So here is uh, Sister Macara Magellan again. She was a connection uh, between the sheltered sea people and the uh, Ogoni people in Nigeria supporting each other. And then after 13 years, justice comes. Dutch court ordered Shell to pay harm done to Nigerian farmers. Shell Not just the activists who had been murdered, right. but all of the farmers in those two villages. The Dutch courts have, have, have held Shell uh, accountable the case is the first in which a company and its foreign subsidiaries have been tried in the Netherlands for allegedly breaking, breaching care of duty abroad and its far-reaching implications um, should be addressed in the, in the years ahead.
Mount Towers of Glendalough National Park is considered by many to be the most finely constructed and beautiful towers in Ireland. It's situated in a valley in a thick forest at the end of two lakes. 30 meters tall, the tower is built of mica schist with granite doorway. It was an ancient gathering place in Glendalough before even Christian times, and the dating of the tower and what it was about is still in dispute. Um, it became a Christian monastery established by a hermit who was following the tradition of pre-Christian hermits, a Saint Kevin. And he lived in this valley from 498 to 618 AD. Clustered about the base of the tower are the remains of a 1200 year old church, an old cathedral, and the first functioning university. Um, there's many hikes around the Glendalough area because it is part of the national parks. Uh, when we were younger, we traveled many places in the world and, and saw many places, but somehow going back to Ireland over and over again is like going to a second home and going to meet old friends and new friends from each time. In the middle picture is a woman who decided to live in Ireland. She's French. Her name is Colette Mugan. And we always go back to visit her. <laughs> yeah. And uh, she, and is she a takes guide. us to amazing places. And she is a, an environmental activist on her she own. She is. She's a guide. And on her own vacations, she ends up going to a place like Greece and working with um, Syrian women who have been you know, going going to to witness artists. and to uh, and to do things to help folks who are who are immigrants in, into uh, um, Europe for the first time. Another friend is of the upper left, uh, Betty Schultz and her husband Fritz and her grandson, and we see her in County Mayo every time we go back. Mm -hmm. And we've been introduced to all of the people involved uh, with Shell to Sea through her. And she was, was also involved in Shell to Sea. Yeah. yeah. That's her, her, her grandchild in with her and her, and her husband who died in 2018, who aged a lot during Shell to Sea. And she's a, a widow now. The top center picture is a couple their names are uh, Colum and Gabrielle, and that where they're standing is in front of their house, and that is where the pipe comes in to uh, Broadhaven Bay. And they can't even go go swimming in the they place where they've swimming, had for years and years. But you know, I, I guess it's time for us to bring it around to an end.